Hi everyone, um, I'm going to change topics quite drastically. Um, so I'm, I'm David Springer, I'm a final year DEFL student here at the Hall. I'm busy writing up my thesis, I'll be to submit soon. So I suppose you could think this is quite a big viber. <laughs> um, I've been at the Hall since 2010, so I think as Nick Barcher said, I've taken a very long time to grow up. Um, I saw a great quote the other day saying that graduate studies is the snooze button on the alarm clock of life. <laughs> um, while I'm snoozing, I've done some work on well, I've up with cell phones um, uh, to try and detect rheumatic heart disease, which I'll explain in a minute. And I'll explain why there's an egg cut in the bottom of the slide in a minute. Um, so first, talking about rheumatic heart disease. So you may not have heard of that, but you may have heard of strep throat, which is an infection you get when you're a kid, and only about five, between five and ten years old. And somewhere like the UK, where the medication is quite easy to get, uh, you go to the pharmacy or doctor and get simple penicillin, and I'll stop the disease progressing. But in places, uh, other places around the world where kids can't get treatment for the disease, you can spread it to other parts of your body, like your brain and your skin and your joints, and importantly your heart, where it leads to damage of the valves within your heart, which control the flow of blood. Um, now this is most prevalent in uh, developing areas. This valve damage, this damage to the heart, is what's termed rheumatic heart disease. Has been shown that reoccurring bouts of rheumatic fever or strep throat causes the worst damage to the heart valves. It's most prevalent in developing areas of the world, confined by poverty and malnutrition and overcrowding. So, places in Africa, so uh, Southern Africa, as well as interestingly, the indigenous populations of uh, Australia and New Zealand, where again, due to socioeconomic factors, and I think a genetic predisposition to the disease means very prevalent there. Um, it's rheumatic heart disease leads to uh, one and a half million deaths annually around the world. And um, to put that in comparison with another disease, that's about a third of the number of deaths due to malaria. And that's a very conservative estimate. Recent studies by my collaborators in Cape Town have shown that with newer uh, diagnostic methodologies, the number is actually much higher. It actually expects to be um, about the same as malaria around the world. And um, it's the highest contributor to cardiovascular deaths in young adults and children worldwide. Um, now, diagnosis of the disease, if kids are diagnosed young, normally by a doctor, a trained cardiologist using a stethoscope or something like echocardiography, where they image the heart to see what it looks like. Um, if kids are diagnosed young, they can get simple penicillin treatment, normally uh, administered for 10 years, and this stops them getting heart failure. Uh, if they don't get treatment, normally by the time they're 30. Uh, but that's amazing. If they get simple penicillin when they first get rheumatic heart disease, it stops them getting heart failure when they're 30. But the problem here is that uh, trained cardiologists and expensive equipment like cardiography isn't prevalent in the areas where rheumatic heart disease is. So the project I've been working on in the last couple of years is trying to figure uh, make a simple tool, tool that's easy to use, you don't need training for, uh, that's readily available, that can automatically detect kids with rheumatic heart disease. So this is where that egg cup comes back into the, the story. So. This is the mobile stethoscope. So in the top left, you can see a stainless steel egg cup with a microphone of a hands-free kit from the phone stuck in the back of it. Uh, that's a low-cost stethoscope there. The idea is to use the stethoscope to record the sounds the heart makes onto a mobile phone and automatically analyze these sounds for murmurs or, or pathological sounds that are indicative of rheumatic heart disease. So the idea here would be that, obviously, 10-year-old like, kids in the Kailicha Township outside of Cape Town don't have access to an I the latest iPhone to record their heart sounds. And the idea is that these could be used by teachers in a school to screen their kids once a year for the condition and pass those who are at risk of having rheumatic heart disease on for uh, a gold standard evaluation. Um, so I'm going to give you now a five minute overview of the key three chapters of my thesis. And I'm not going to give too much detail, I'll keep it nice and simple with some pretty pictures. But the three key steps, uh, the three main chapters of my piece are ensuring that the recordings you get are high quality. Obviously using an egg cup, you're not going to get great quality hard sound recordings all the time. So how do you automatically classify the signal quality of those recordings? Secondly, how do you find the important sounds in these recordings? And by important, I mean the first and second hard sounds. So think of your heart beating, it makes a lub dub, lub dub, lub dub sound. I'm trying to find exactly where these lub and dub sounds are in the recording. And that's important because then I can search between these sounds for murmurs, at least abnormal uh, sounds that are indicative of rheumatic heart disease. So, chapter one, assessing the signal quality of these sounds. 
So the top is a nice high quality signal recorded with this mobile phone stethoscope device and nice repetitive peaks to your hard sounds. Quite a lot of background noise in that, but you can still hear the hard sounds and uh, a panel of three cardiologists have said that that's high quality. On the bottom, um, you can see a low quality signal. So that's mainly just background noise with the no noise spikes. And I want to try automatically tell the difference between these two types of recordings. And just looking at these by themselves, it's quite hard to teach a computer the difference between those two. But if you transform the signal into something a bit simpler, called the autocorrelation, the solid line is a high quality signal. So it shows nice repetitive peaks and autocorrelation. This is due to autocorrelation is basically sliding the signal over itself and accentuates repetitive uh, peaks in the signal. So nice repetitive peaks in the solid line and uh, of high amplitude uh, and, and low complexity, near it's fairly repetitive. So that's a nice high quality signal. Uh, the dotted line uh, over it is a low quality one, so fairly random, no nice big peaks. Uh, and so teaching a computer the difference between these two is a little bit easier. What I do is extract what are called features in machine learning, which are exactly that, so the, how big the spikes are, how repetitive they are, and how complex the signal is. And then I feed it into a machine learning algorithm. Now, machine learning is, can be abstractly portrayed as basically this. So a 3D plot of the three features I'm extracting. Uh, on the right-hand side in the orange are good quality recordings, uh, green on the left-hand side are bad quality, and the purple in between is called the, the hyperplane or the decision boundary. So if a, a point of recording lies on the right-hand side of the decision boundary, it's good quality, on the left-hand side is bad quality. And this is generated using something called the support vector machine, which won't go into detail about, but that's in a, one picture is machine learning. So that's what I've applied to try to tell the difference between good and bad quality hard sound recordings. Chapter one, done. Good. And second is finding the important sounds in these recordings. And this is called hard sound segmentation. It's finding exactly where these important sounds are, which to a human who's very good at finding patterns and signals, it's quite easy listening to a recording, teaching a computer to do the same in noisy recordings is a little bit harder. And as shown here, what I want to do is chop up the signal into S1, which is the first hard sound, S2, which is the second hard sound, and systole and diastole between these two. And so I can search within systole and diastole for these pathological moments. And so that's the aim over here. And I've used something called uh, hidden Markov models or conditional random fields uh, to do this. I'm not going to detail about those either. But at the other end of this, you get a nice pretty picture that looks like this. So at the top is the output from the algorithm. So this, this, these steps here show the first hard sound, systole, second hard sound, and diastole of the hard sound recording in the middle. Uh, the ECG is shown at the bottom here just for reference. Um, and this works really well. So it's, this is a patient with a, quite a severe uh, systolic murmur, um, which you can't really see here. So that's evidence here, these high amplitude bits. And this algorithm does well at ignoring those and noise spikes and finding the important hard sounds. Um, so that works really well, so that's nice. And then the last chapter is the important bit. So actually finding these pathological sounds, uh, uh, pathological moments in these hard sounds. Um, and here's an example of a, a, a murmur from a patient recorded with this mobile phone device. So here's one heart cycle. So the first heart sound on the left-hand side, and the second heart sound here. And it doesn't look like there's much of a difference here, just looking at the amplitude of the signal. But if you look at the bottom, um, this is the frequency content in the, in the heart sound. The first heart sound here with high frequency content. The second heart sound here with also high frequency content. But importantly, this arcing band between the two at about 100 hertz, that's a clear indication of a murmur due to rheumatic heart disease. And so what I, want, what I do when I try and find these murmurs is transform the signal into the frequency domain, analyze features from that, trying to diagnose these kids for murmurs. And if all the recordings look this clean and this great, it would be a very easy task. Unfortunately, they obviously don't. I'm using an egg cup to record heart sounds. They aren't always that good. And also, it's also confounded by the fact that I have to find real murmurs. So again, the first and second heart sounds here, and the frequency content at the bottom, which what looks like uh, could be a pathological murmur. This is what's called an innocent murmur, or benign murmur, which kids get. 80% uh, of children get this. Just because the flow of blood around their hearts, they get something that looks like a pathological murmur. And so I have to tell the difference between that and the real one, which, again, makes it a bit more complicated. Um, again, using a machine learning technique uh, that I showed earlier, 
Um, these are the first results I've got on, I've got recordings from 100 kids from Carnage Township of Cape Town. Uh, 50 of them are, uh, have got traumatic heart disease and some bowel damage, and 50 of them are healthy. So a nice match uh, set there. What I do is uh, apply again support vector machine, uh, machine learning classification. And these are all right. So when classifying the difference between these two classes, I get 76% accuracy, and so that's over the whole set. Importantly, I get 69% sensitivity. So this is the, uh, of the, the kids, of the 50 kids who have rheumatic heart disease, how accurate am I of picking those ones up? So if, I mean, if you think of a cancer test and someone comes in to ask all the cancer tests, and if they do have cancer, for this test they have a 30% chance of not being picked up. That's not that great as a diagnostic tool in itself. Um, but, again, this is using a mobile phone and an egg cup. If I compare that to the, the cardiologist who used, who used her own stethoscope to diagnose these kids, she only gets 14% sensitivity, whereas the cardio scan, which is the commercial software, uh, only gets 5%. So using an egg cup and a phone at the moment, these are, you're the first people I present these results to, so uh, congrats. Um, the, yeah, so using an egg cup and a mobile phone, I outperform a cardiologist when diagnosing kids with traumatic classes at the moment. Um, and that's about it. Thanks uh, to my supervisors and my collaborators in Cape Town and funding bodies.